This is me when I was five years old. This was my best friend, Patrick. And we had a bit of a problem on our hands. You see, we had a crush on the same girl. <laughs> so, we needed to figure out which one of us she liked more. Now, my argument was simple. I said that she liked me this much. Patrick said she liked him twice this much. So I countered and said that she liked me 10 times this much. But then Patrick countered my counter and said that she actually liked him this much times 10 times 10 times 10. So I thought of the biggest number I could and said that she actually liked me this much times in uh, a million. But then the un unthinkable happened. Patrick said the I word, infinity, right? Patrick said that she liked him this much times infinity, and that was it. I was toast. You can't beat infinity. Patrick wins fair and square, right? Now, I was five, so I got over it pretty quickly, probably by the end of that birthday party. But you can imagine my surprise when 15 years later, I found out that I actually had given up too early. I was still in the running for my crush. You see, we usually think about infinity like this. Two is greater than one, and three is greater than two, and this goes on and on forever. And so we come up with a concept called infinity that just represents the number that's bigger than any finite number. And this is exactly why Patrick won on that fateful day. But as I was learning now, albeit 15 years too late, there actually is more than one kind of infinity. In fact, there are infinitely many different kinds of infinities, each one being larger than the one before it. So this picture of infinity that we have here is actually a little too simple. Instead, this infinity is just one kind of infinity, and there's another infinity that's larger than it, and another that's larger than it, and this goes on and on forever. So yes, I was still in the running for my crush from 15 years before, but at this point in my life, this was meaning something much deeper for me. You see, if, if math can involve things as cool as whether or not there's more than one kind of infinity, and if I was only just now at the age of 20 or so finding out about it, then what else did math have in store for me? What other secrets was math hiding? And I decided to find out, so in my second year at Columbia, I started majoring in math, and what I found completely blew me away. I found that math is not just about factoring polynomials or learning how to do long division. It's about questions. That's it. Now, these questions might be, how do you factor a polynomial, or how do you divide one number by another number? But they could also be, is there more than one kind of infinity? Or how about the following seemingly totally random question? Can I take this donut made out of Play-Doh and turn it into a coffee mug made out of Play-Doh without breaking or pinching off any Play-Doh? The answer is yes, and here's the proof. Now, you might not think that this is math, but there's actually a serious field of math called topology that studies questions just like this. And while we're on the subject of totally random questions, let me ask another one. If we, have a, if we imagine that I have a knot of string like this, can I turn this knot into this knot without breaking the string at all? Or how about this knot and this knot? The answer to both of these questions is yes, and you can have fun proving this to yourself at home by rigging this up with some shoelace or something like that. And again, there's actually a serious field of math, creatively titled Not Theory, that studies questions just like this. Now, I want to ask, oh, went the wrong way. I want to ask one more question, but in order to do this, I need to talk about perfect numbers for a second. And the clicker is no longer, there we go. I want to talk about perfect numbers for a second. Now, I know that we all think of something when we think of perfect numbers, maybe a perfect number that you want to see when you step on the scale in the morning, or maybe a perfect number that you want to see written on your paychecks, or what have you. Uh, but I want to talk about a different kind of perfect number for a second. Let me take six as an example. Six is three times two, and it's also one times six, and that's it. If we disregard the six and add up the remaining numbers, we get six. So six is a perfect number. This is what we'll call numbers that have this behavior. So let's look at four, for example. Four is two times two, and it's also one times four. If we disregard the four and add up what's left, we get five, which isn't four, so four is not perfect. How about 15? 
15 is three times five, it's also one times 15. We disregard the 15, we add up what's left, and we get nine, which isn't 15, so 15 is not perfect. Let me show you one more example, 28. 28 is two times 14, it's four times seven, and it's one times 28. If you get rid of the 28, and if you add up what's left, you'll get, I promise, 28. So 28 is perfect. Now, there are actually quite a few perfect numbers out there. Six and 28, like we just saw. 496, but I won't prove that to you here. Uh, 8,128, but I definitely won't prove that to you here. But you don't need to take my word for it, you can take Euclid's word for it. He was one of the greatest mathematicians of all time and he knew about these four perfect numbers almost uh, about 2,500 years ago. But then 2,000 years went by and no one was able to find another perfect number. Now I don't know about you, but that would kind of encourage me to stop looking. <laughs> but in about 1450, 2,000 years after these four perfect numbers were found, someone in Germany, found that 33,550,336 is perfect. And that was totally my next guess too, by the way. Um, but I won't prove that to you here. But what I do wanna do is ask a, a slightly related question. If we look at all these perfect numbers, we see that they're all even numbers. So I wanna ask, are there any perfect numbers that are odd? Turns out no one yet knows the answer to this question. Someone said yes, if you can prove that there are, if you can find an odd perfect number, or if you can prove that there's some reason why there can't be one, please let me know about it first and we'll publish it together. I'm a PhD student, I need all the publications I can get. <laughs> but you see, when I was in high school, I had no idea that there were still unsolved problems in math. I guess I just kind of figured that someone a long time ago found an algebra textbook under a rock one day and boom, math class was born. But what I was finding now is that math is actually created by people. People like you and me who simply ask questions. For example, Pythagoras was a person, you've probably heard about him. He has a theorem, you've probably heard about that one. But he didn't always have a theorem. For a while, he just had a question. You know, how do the three lengths of a right triangle relate to each other? But then he answered his question and he proved that he had the right answer and he turned his question into a theorem. In other words, he literally created math. Mind blowing, right? <laughs> and math is actually still being created to this very day. Just last year, a group of researchers found a new perfect number. And this perfect number is 46 million 498,850 digits long. <laughs> now, remember, this happened just last year, 2017, okay? But in school, we learn math that's many, many centuries, sometimes even millennia old. So this would literally be like going into your music class and only ever getting to listen to Gregorian chants, which, if you don't know, sounds something like this. Now, Gregorian chant is important. Every genre of music that you listen to or any that you've ever heard of before has its origin somewhere, somehow, maybe indirectly, in Gregorian chant. But we also know that music is so much more than just Gregorian chant. But you see, in school we learn the Gregorian chant of the math that's really out there. When it, and then we start to equate this Gregorian chant with all of math itself, when in reality there's so much more. For example, we learn about area and perimeter in school. These ideas have been known to humankind for thousands of years now. So these are quite literally the Gregorian chant of math. But what if we took these old ideas and asked something new? What if we asked, could we find a shape whose area is finite but whose perimeter is infinite. It turns out we can, and to find this shape, we draw a triangle like this, we split each of its sides into three equal lengths, and on the middle segment of each side, we build a new triangle. 
and then we repeat this. On each side, we split each side up into three equal lengths, and on the middle segment of each side, we draw a new triangle. And then we repeat this over and over and over and over again, infinitely many times. And what you'll get at the end of this is a shape whose area is just eight-fifths the area of the original triangle, but whose perimeter is infinite. So this means that you can paint this shape with some finite amount of paints, but if you put your pencil down on the paper to try to draw this shape, you'd never finish. This crazy shape is called the Koch snowflake after a guy named Helga von Koch who found this shape only 100 years ago. So even though, well, he's got a very sweet mustache, which might be distracting, but even though these ideas that he used to find this shape, area and perimeter, had been around for thousands of years, it was only 100 years ago that he found this shape. Helga von Koch just happened to ask the right question. And believe it or not, there are people to this day, lots of them in fact, myself included, who make a living asking questions and trying to find their answers. They're called mathematicians, and they still exist. I'm your proof of that. And you see, when I was in high school, I had no idea that mathematicians still existed, creating math to this very day, let alone that I could actually become one. But there's really nothing stopping any of you guys from going home tonight and becoming a mathematician. Just ask a question and see if you can answer it. If you can prove that you have the right answer, you'll turn your question into a theorem. And maybe you'll stumble across a whole new class of questions that no one has asked before and discover a whole new field of math, your very own topology or not theory. And maybe people a thousand years from now will be studying your work. But no matter what, what you will find is that math is not at all what you thought it was. Thank you.